Well, hello, everybody. Um, you know, it's definitely an exciting time to be in real estate. Uh, we're going to do something a little bit different this week. Um, as always, I'm Stephen Mead, your host for our Southern California real estate market update. Uh, this is for June 14th. I can't believe it already. Almost midway through the year, 2022. Um, obviously, I'm the broker owner here at Domicile Real Estate, real estate for people who love houses, which hopefully is you if you're watching this. So we're going to do something a little bit different that I don't normally do. And that is I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of bigger, more national issues, because I think, um, you know, most of you might have heard, especially if you're involved in the industry, or uh, if you're interested in the industry, or if you kind of have friends that are buying or whatever, you probably heard that yesterday was uh, really quite a crazy day on the mortgage markets and that mortgage rates um, jumped the largest amount they have jumped in a single day, uh, pretty much in in a, in a decade. And you know, obviously, that is a that is an earthquake level of a shift, right? And one of the things we've talked about in the past is this idea of markets trying to find equilibrium, meaning when there's a shock to the system, the market will react and try to find a new equilibrium. That's what it does. It, it's a machine, and that pretty much is its only purpose. It it, it doesn't have feelings, but um, the market is always looking for that equilibrium point of stability. And I'm gonna talk about an article that came out, which I think is interesting. Uh, here, I'll, I'll screen share this real quick. I hope this is gonna work. Perfect. Um, this is in Fortune Magazine. This article actually came out yesterday, uh, very timely. Um, the 40 overvalued housing markets could see 15 to 20% home price declines if a recession hits. Um, you know, that that's kind of the headline. I'll, I'll spare you uh, the detail of looking this up on your own. Southern California is not listed in these 40 overvalued housing markets. Uh, most of these markets are markets that have been, I might even call them sort of like work from home target markets, Boise, Idaho, portions of Texas, Florida, uh, really markets that have just traditionally been lower cost markets that have seen uh, really big price increases and a result of a lot of net migration. Now, obviously buried deep behind this headline, uh, you know, the, this particular economist, and, and believe me, economists all have different opinions. Uh, basically, you know, his prediction really is that America as a whole will probably be flat, maybe maybe 5% negative in home prices overall, but that some of these markets will actually be hit quite a bit worse and that these are these 40, 40 markets. Now, something that I've always found a little bit tricky about these kinds of predictions is, you know, defining what does overvalued mean and how does somebody come up with the idea that real estate is overvalued in a particular market. Um, in this particular case, they're using sort of an income analysis for that. So they're saying uh, median home price as a percentage or, or as a multiple, uh, you know, how as a multiple of median household income in a particular area and say, what has it historically been right on average? And I mean, that's one way to do it. I, th I think there's some flaws for that flaws, uh, in fact, in our particular market. Um, and probably the biggest reason that this is a flaw is that a lot of the home prices are being driven by, honestly, people who already owned homes and were pumping equity from one home into another. Um, I know in the Southern California market, that is a very profound effect. Most of our first time home buyers who are not coming in with a ton of equity are very high income earners. Higher, not just in terms of dollars, but higher in terms of what, what percentage are they in our society, right? Like a lot of our first time home buyers are five and 10 percenters, right? And whether that's right or wrong, you, you know, you can certainly have an opinion about that, whether that's fair or not. I actually don't think it's fair. But the fact is, that means that our market is not nearly as, as, as income driven, maybe as other markets around the country. And I think that's something to sort of take into account. But I want to go over something that I think is very important for people to understand. This was not a clickbaity title. Um, I really want to be honest. And I'm going to talk about the number one mistake that people make uh, when making real estate decisions. And Gosh, if I had a dollar every time I've seen somebody make this mistake, um, I, I would be independently wealthy uh, and sitting on a beach sipping cocktails right about now. And that mistake is, I won't keep you waiting, 
that mistake is really overvaluing um, and overweighting short-term things in their decision-making and either ignoring or underweighting things that are in the long run, right? And I, I try to weave a little bit of that in when we have these talks because I think everything seems both in the short term, things look worse than they actually are and better than they actually are. So we tend to overstate both the positives and the negatives of the data that's right in front of us. And it sort of, it doesn't just happen in real estate. This is kind of a common human analysis flaw. It kind of comes from our, our lizard brain, right? Our fight or flight, our survival instinct. Uh, we, we tend to overemphasize the things that are right in front of us in the immediate future uh, from a safety perspective. And we tend to ignore those things that are in the long run. And so, you know, when we sit down with clients, our goal is not to think, are you going to be happy a year from now? No, that, that is important. It's, are you going to be happy 10 years from now, 20 years from now? What kind of trajectory are we trying to set? And trying to understand, are we making choices that are going to lead you down a path where, you know, where you, in 20 years, you are less able to afford a mistake. And what I mean by that is, if, if you are 30 years old and you're listening to this video right now, you can make a lot of short-term mistakes and probably not alter your trajectory that much, right? You, these are things that are recoverable, right? It's like being on a plane. If you have an engine go out at 40,000 feet, it's unfortunate, but that's a solvable problem. There's a lot of time before you hit the ground, right? Even if you, even if you dip down, right? You have a lot of time to save it. If you have just taken off, and you are 200 feet off the ground and an engine fails, that is a much more acute problem. So when you're young and if you are 30 years old and you're planning on retiring at 65, you have 35 years, meaning you know, if you buy a home that maybe wasn't the right house to buy or maybe you buy a home that lost 5% of its value, um, you, know, you have time, you can wait. Um, and that's something that I think a lot of people don't really understand so they make these decisions based out of what is right in front of them, not understanding that where they should be looking is, how is this going to affect me 30 years from now? Is this an unrecoverable mistake? Or is this a mistake that would be unfortunate, but could be turned into a, a positive move later that would make up for it, right? That would even things out. So I also want to talk a little bit about, and I know we're kind of just running through these things before we get into our stats. We're going to talk about the Federal Reserve and, and the Federal Reserve making moves and runaway inflation and an economic recession. And I'm gonna repeat this, you know, as an economist, by far and away, a recession is the lesser of two evils versus runaway inflation. Um, you know, the issue that we have right now is that wages are not keeping up with inflation. We're seeing basic goods prices, especially food uh, jumping through, and really there needs to be a reset. We're also dealing with sort of these supply chain issues, which are a huge drag on things. Um, so by resetting demand, we can actually finally catch up and get beyond this. So there's a lot of reasons why at this juncture, the Fed will want to induce a recession. Now their hope will be that it will be a fairly shallow recession that will not last very long, right? They're, they're just trying to shock the system out of some of these problems. Whether that will work or not, I, I think is you know anybody's real guess at this point. But if, if you told me today, your choices are, keep dealing with the runaway inflation or try to do something about it at the risk of having a recession, I think it is 10 times over worth the risk to do that. The only people really that are against this are elected officials because nobody wants to be in power when a recession starts. You wanna be in power when recessions end so you can take credit for it. Whether, whether you actually are involved in that or not, that is the public perception. So there we go, let's start off, let's go through the stats because honestly, it is an interesting week for a lot of reasons. So total active listings, where are we at, right? Um, if we look at kind of like our peak summertime last year, we were at around uh, 9,000 total listings on the market. As of today, we were about 10,500 listings. So, uh, you know, we're roughly 20% higher than our peak in terms of active listings on the market. I think this is generally a good thing. This is not a gluttony of supply. This is just a bit more supply. 
Here's our 14 days of new listings. You see a big dip here. What is that dip? That dip is basically uh, Memorial Day weekend. Nobody wants to list their houses. So you have a week where everything's lower and then it starts to catch up again. Um, we're seeing overall these new listings are actually down a little bit, especially when you look versus last year. Overall, these numbers are down in terms of new things coming to the market. Now, if we go to our new escrows, unfortunately, new escrows are also down, right? Like, so at this point last year, we were roughly 4,000 new escrows a week. Right now, we are basically at right about 3,000. Uh, maybe low 3,000. So basically down by about 25% in terms of number of new escrows happening and, and going into escrow each week, despite having more inventory. So in the past, I've used the term um, supply constricted deal volume. That is no longer the case in my opinion. Now, if we look at our absorption rate, um, you'll notice that our under 1 million that absorption rate is right about 70%. That's kind of the bottom end of sort of a gentle seller's market, meaning still tilted towards sellers, but not wildly so. Um, we've gotten our one to $2 million category though. Look at how this has eroded um, and really started to separate out from our under 1 million category, um, showing that we are now in those kind of mid fifties. This is, this is much more of a balanced supply and demand and that one to $2 million price range. Again, this is for Los Angeles and Orange counties. Now we've got our closed prices and we've got this divided by tranches. So remember this date is four to six weeks old. So I would say this was when a lot of people said the market felt like it was cooling off, right? When that started, here is our data on closed sales at our 75th percentile level. We are maybe trending down over that last month or two average a little bit. Uh, we're definitely down week over week or for the past two weeks, um, definitely down week over week in our median category here, but still generally trading in the same range since April. And then at our entry level, we are also down again this past week. So all three price points are down. That leads me to believe this isn't just really a fluke. These indicators are all moving in the same direction, but we're really not far off from where we've been. We've got, we're still in that range of fluctuations that we, that we've been seeing. Um, and again, this is sort of a whole market. So I've said this a bunch of times before, but if you go to look at a house and that open house is filled with people and the pictures look gorgeous and it was in Sunset Magazine last month, that house will probably get multiple bids and you will not be able to dictate all the terms you'd like as a buyer. That market has not flipped. However, if there was a home that maybe started off in the market a bit overpriced, the seller was uh, a little slow to put it where it should be priced. Now it's been in the market 30 days. Perhaps it's got some things about it that aren't great. Maybe it doesn't show well in pictures. That kind of house, on the other hand, is going to be a very different negotiating type of a feeling. So understand, even within these price range tranches here, um, you're going to see really kind of some wildly different markets depending on the exact properties you are looking at. If you are a seller, what does this mean for you? Well, if you're a seller, it says you'll want to be the one that people are going crazy over. It is worth putting your time in, you know, Maybe six months ago, I would have told clients it's not even worth staging houses because you'll get offers anyway. Just make what you have look presentable. Now it's worth it to do these things again. So if we look at our still active, that number has crept up a bit. We're kind of towards the high end, but it's not completely unreasonable. For one to two million, it has gone down a bit. I think there's a little bit of an anomaly in the data that we need to check. This graph though, let's talk about this. Um, this tells you kind of how quickly that balance between um, demand has changed, right? And I said we were going to see these numbers head back towards um, around 100%, right, of list price. And we we're going to see this kind of dive. I think this might be a little bit of a reaction. We'll see a little bit of a bounce here. But understand, like, this is changing, right? This is a market that is fundamentally getting away from this everybody's paying 105% of list price. Like that is that is not the market that we're gonna be on. on it. You may still see homes where that happens, but that will not be the market average, which is what this is measuring. Now, if we look at our days on market for new contracts, this is kind of an especially interesting one too. I think I told you that last week we saw a spike and that I was wondering, was that related to the holiday weekend and we we're gonna see that back down? In fact, it has, but these numbers are still higher than we've been at. 
Now they're not high in general, right? This, what is this saying? The homes that are attractive, that are getting offers, they're getting them fairly quickly, right? These homes are going under contract pretty quickly when they are the desirable homes. So again, this is a lesson to understand that inventory is rising, but the days in the market for the homes actually finding buyers is rising, but much more slowly. So what we're, what we're seeing and what this tells you if you're a seller is you want to be one of those homes that gets the attention early on. If you're a buyer, it's the opposite. Don't look for the pretty houses. Don't look for the houses where the open house is bombarded with people. Those aren't the ones that really are going to be your best bets right now. And now, probably my favorite graph of all, I've really sort of fallen in love with looking at this and you know, something that I want to show you and that we've talked about a lot, and I'm going to go off the screen share here just for a second. So at the end of the day, consumers make what they think is the best choice based on the options they have available. So if you are a first time home buyer, and if some of you are out there, hopefully you watch our other video that comes out on Fridays, inevitably, you will look and be like, I can rent for this, or my rent has gone up to this, or this is what buying looks like. This is the choice that you are making and how you most likely will make your decision. Now, we talked about that's probably even a little bit too short term of thinking, and you really want to look beyond that. But let's pretend for a moment that you are strictly looking at what is in front of you, which is honestly what most people do. To me, the most important metric of are we overpriced, right, is watching this separation between our rent index and our payment index. And you'll see our payment index drop largely on those prices easing this week. Now, I will tell you, we've not incorporated yesterday's mortgage rate increases into this. We go by a Freddie Mac index that's released one day a week. So understand that maybe this is shaped a little bit downward, but look at where we are on this. This gap has narrowed. So we went through all of 2021 with our rent index and our payment index very similar. Only when rates started to jump up did we see this gap grow and the rents were just delayed a little bit behind and look what has happened. These are not that far away from each other. So when I look here, this is probably at around 151, 152% or probably 142%. So we're probably nine or 10% away from each other on these. And that's the reason why when I look at this graph and I think to myself like, oh, are we completely screwed in our housing market? Probably not. And the reason why probably not is because these things are not out of whack to me. I think this is a much better measurement of are we overvalued or not. Finally, we have our interest rate graph. You see things starting to rise up, but the reality is they have actually risen up quite a bit. This is our Freddie Mac national average. Um, you're going to see that that number is next week. I promise you it will bump up pretty high. So what does this leave us, right? And, and what does this mean if you're a buyer or a seller? What is my advice? Well, if you're a seller, um, you know, honestly evaluate, is this the right time for me to sell? You know, if you try to time the real estate market, that is tricky business and people who are experts in it get it wrong frequently. So Timing that part of the market is very difficult, but what you can do is time when you sell. So it's a lot easier to time when you sell than it is to time when you buy. And that's because you know a lot of the data about when you're selling. But really look and sit down and say, is this the right time to make that, to make that move? And one of the reasons why I'm hitting at this point is that really is going to determine our market. At the end of the day, prices are determined by the balance between supply and demand. If you have way more demand than supply, then prices will go up. If you have way more supply than demand, prices will go down. And there's really, two, you know, you've got two levers you can manipulate. So what are we seeing when rates go up? We're seeing demand go down. The problem is we still have a very low level of housing supply in California. Like we, we just don't have enough fundamental units. So the real question is, if we're seeing the supply go up in our market of available inventory, right? Homes that you can put an offer on. The question is, if those sellers don't get the, the amount of money they want, are they still going to move? Are they going to lower their price until they sell? Or are they going to pull those homes off the market? If they pull those homes off the market, 
guess what? That supply demand balance doesn't change very much and neither do prices. Now, if those people just start to panic and say, I need to get my equity out while I still can, that could have the opposite effect, right? That is what induces price drops is when you have a bunch of sellers who feel panicked like they need to get out now. So that's kind of what we're looking at in terms of the expectation. So that's what I'm watching. That's what I'm looking at. But do I think fundamentally are we overvalued? If we are, it's by 5%, maybe 10 at the most. I just don't see because those our rent market is still very strong. It means that most people who are no longer looking for houses are now looking for rentals, which has pushed the rental market up. We don't. We fundamentally just don't have any more housing. We haven't created. We've just shifted how much inventory is for sale and how much inventory is for rent. We've reduced the amount for rent and increased the amount for sale, but we haven't actually gotten any more houses for people to live in. Any other questions, comments? As always, we love them and cherish them. So definitely make those. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. And then finally, um, if you or someone you know is looking to buy or sell or just needs real estate advice and wants to talk through a scenario, absolutely reach out to us. We are here for you in the Southern California market. We will see you again real soon.